It is Monday, November the 6th, and this is The National. You'll notice some things are new tonight, including the fact we're coming to you from three cities. I'm Adrian Arsenault in Toronto. I'm Rosemary Barton in Ottawa. I'm Andrew Chang in Vancouver. And I'm Ian Hanamansing in Toronto. One thing that isn't new, the journalism you expect, that will stay the same. On this night, a small town in the United States still reeling from a shooting at a church, but we begin with gun violence here at home. We're learning tonight a police officer was shot and killed while on duty in Abbotsford. That's about an hour east of Vancouver. Now, there are lots of questions about the officer, the shooter, and what exactly happened. But here's what we know. This is the moment when police took down the suspected shooter. It all started just minutes before in the parking lot of a shopping mall. Another driver sees the suspect, thinks his car is stolen, and actually boxes him in with his vehicle, waiting for police to arrive. But that's when police say the suspect gets out with a shotgun and starts firing. Incredibly, no one gets hurt then and there. But when police arrive, there was more gunfire and an officer was hit. He died a short time later in hospital. I was able to uh, meet with uh, the spouse of this person uh, and uh, deliver the horrible news face to face. It's something I never wanted to have to do in my life, uh, but I did it today, folks. Now, police eventually caught the suspect. He was hurt, taken to hospital. Well, let's go to Greg Rasmussen right now, who's in Abbotsford for us tonight. Uh, Greg, you haven't had a whole lot of time to piece everything together, but can you tell us what you're seeing and what police are looking for? Well, right now there's still a very large police presence here. And all of this went down in a fairly small geographic area. There's a gas station over here uh, to my left, and that's where things started. As you mentioned, uh, the, su the, um, uh, the person who called 911 thought there was a suspicious person in what he believed to be a stolen vehicle. Um, there was a confrontation there, and then it quickly moved uh, from there, uh, just about 100 meters or so, to my right, and behind me, you can still see the, the police uh, lights flashing there. And that's where the officer was shot. And we talked to some people this afternoon who witnessed some of this, at least they heard part of it at first, and they thought it was just firecrackers. We're close to Halloween, and they thought they heard some noise. Uh, they happened to look outside, and then they saw that this was, in fact, a very serious incident. Uh, the witness we talked to said the officer was down on the ground, not showing much uh, sign of life at that point, and he feared for his life, and later uh, we did learn that he had, in fact, died. The suspect then, though, fled the scene, uh, went down the road behind me, uh, and by that time there was a large police police presence and they were able to capture him. Uh, the police chief today talked about the heroics of all the officers involved, uh, the one who gave his life as well as uh, those who responded and did their job and arrested the suspect. All right, Greg Rasmussen reporting for us tonight. Thanks very much. And we know uh, policing, it is a dangerous job, but officers being shot and killed like this is a pretty rare thing in this country. Consider that between 2005 and 2015, 22 officers were victims of a homicide. That's according to Statistics Canada. And Ian, this is going to be a, it's a sad, but, but also a defining moment in British Columbia's history. Because if you look back at, at officers who have been shot and killed, you have to go back 30 years to see something similar. So a pretty staggering thing that's happened today. And we both know Abbotsford very well. And, uh, you know, one moment it's a peaceful, small city. The next moment an incident like this uh, happens. Yeah. Well, Andrew, more than 24 hours after 26 people were gunned down in a Texas church, we still don't know the answer to the most perplexing questions. Why would someone do this and what can be done to stop mass shootings? Well, tonight we'll look at how the U.S. is responding from the president to the neighbors of those killed in tiny Sutherland Springs. But first, what we know as of this hour about the massacre. We've had a long night with our children and grandbabies that we have left. That is the church pastor, Frank Pomeroy, who was out of town yesterday. He and his wife lost their 14-year-old daughter, Annabelle Pomeroy, remembered today by her mother, Sherry. Now most of our church family is gone. As senseless as this tragedy was, our sweet Belle would not have been able to deal with losing so much family yesterday. The youngest of the dead, just 18 months old. The eldest, 77. One family lost eight members. 
Brian Holcomb was the fill-in pastor. He and his wife, Carla, their son, and his infant daughter died. So did their daughter-in-law, Crystal, eight months pregnant, as well as three of her five children. They were all shot by 26-year-old Devin Patrick Kelly. He entered the church with an assault rifle and had at least two handguns. When he ran back out, he was shot by a neighbor before he drove off. Today, we heard more from the man who helped chase him down. The shooter and a neighbor uh, had, were both coming out and both had weapons drawn and immediately started exchanging fire. Um, the shooter got in his vehicle and took off. The, the other gentleman who is, who is a member of this community came, jumped in my truck and said, uh, he just shot up the church, we gotta go get him. And I said, okay, let's go. Eventually, Kelly lost control of his vehicle. When police arrived, he was dead. But the autopsy was conducted this morning, and what I can tell you is he sustained three gunshots wounds. Uh, two gunshot wounds were from the armed citizen, and he had a, gun, a third gunshot wound, which the medical examiner described as being consistent with being self-inflicted. We're beginning to learn more about Devin Kelly's background. He received a bad conduct discharge from the Air Force for assaulting his wife and stepson, but that didn't prevent him from getting guns. In fact, he bought at least four over the past four years. As to motive, a hint today from officials. This was not racially motivated. There was, it wasn't over religious beliefs. There was a domestic situation going on within the family and the in-laws. And a troubling admission tonight from the U.S. Air Force. Officials say they failed to alert federal authorities about those convictions. Kelly's name in a database should have prevented him from buying guns and perhaps saved lives in Sutherland Springs. Paul Hunter spent the day talking to people in that community, asking them about what they've lost. Far from the crowds of reporters and police now swarming the hamlet of Sutherland Springs, Doug John plants 26 homemade metal crosses into the ground. A sickeningly familiar tribute in a country where mass killings have become almost routine. But with this one, in tiny Sutherland Springs, home to just a few hundred people, the anguish almost defies description. When shots were heard down the street yesterday, Ramiro Vidal raced toward the church. His mother was inside. The first thing I saw, I saw a body right there in front of the, in front of the door. Then what did you think? And I said, well, God, I said, only one person. And then I was asking for my mom, and this lady told me, no, your mom's all right. She's one of the lucky ones. She left in the hospital. And then I said, how about the rest of them? She said, don't even try to go in there. They're, they're all full of, they're just all dead. Three clips there. Next door, the FBI hears Vidal's cousin explain he'd carried a dying child out from the church. Parents, he tells us, in hysterics. Well, one parent was to try to hold him down, and you know, and I mean, what can you tell him? Tell him he's going to be okay, and there's nothing you can do. We heard stories like that at every single turn. Here lived Crystal Holcomb. Eight months pregnant, she, three of her kids, and four of her in-laws all shot dead. Surrogate grandparents next door, Lupe and Emmanuel Gonzalez. I don't know. I'm in a state of shock right, right now. I just miss them. Emily, she was the first one. And I loved her. Sorry, but I gotta go sit inside. And next door to them, Mary Dykeman, whose son's girlfriend was shot. It's a small town and everybody loves everybody. I don't know why somebody would pick a little small town like this to come and destroy the town. It's, it's, it's hard, it's very hard. I mean, we can see the all the stuff is going on around the world. And we, like those people over there that happened someplace else, like in Vegas and whatever, they got to cope with it. Now it's our turn to cope with it. 
and just take it one day at a time forward. That's all I gotta say for now. It's as if everyone here is family and all of them are scarred. As if the town itself is broken, maybe never to be repaired. And Sutherland Springs is where Paul is tonight. Uh, Paul, as you spoke to people in the community, did anyone raise the issue of guns? Not a single person, Ian. And I say this with the greatest respect to everybody we met because they got a lot on their minds right now. This is a particularly horrific time for everyone, but not even a whisper that maybe guns are a part of the problem here or that maybe toughening gun laws might be a part of the solution. There was none of that. Like, this is Texas, right? 100% guns are a part of the culture here. But it's almost as if there's an acceptance that, you know, one day it'll happen to you. One day it'll be your city or your town or your neighborhood or your hamlet. And that that's just the way it is. Now, you were in Newtown, Connecticut after the shooting that killed 20 children. If ever there was going to be a shooting that would change attitudes and policy in the United States, I suppose it would have been that one, but, but things didn't change. You know, Newtown to me was colossally baffling. It was so sad, right? It was, it was beyond the pale horrific. These were children, right? I cried at Newtown. I can still get choked up thinking about it. It was, it was that bad. And you thought after Newtown that finally there was the impetus. This was the time. It was, it was the tipping point, right? There was broad public impetus for change on this. We saw that with Barack Obama, right? We saw his tears. We saw the legislative proposals he put forward to toughen gun laws. And we saw what happened to them. They failed, right? I was in Newtown for the massacre. I was in Washington when Obama's proposals failed. It was like you could feel the air going out of the balloon. You live in this country long enough, Ian, right? You, you live through the Orlandos and the Las Vegases and the San Bernardinos. You live through things like this and all the smaller mass shootings that don't make the headlines. And there are way more of those, right? You live through all of that and it's hard not to be a cynic. It's hard to believe that on this issue, anything is ever going to change in this country. Well, no talk about gun control there tonight, as you point out, but certainly lots of grief. Thanks, Paul. In the charged partisan atmosphere, mass killings in the United States usually do get political very quickly. Last week, after an immigrant from Uzbekistan who admired ISIS allegedly ran over and killed eight people, the U.S. president said the course of action was clear. Restrict immigration. We have to get much tougher. We have to get much smarter, and we have to get much less politically correct. But in the wake of yesterday's violence, Trump offered no policy response. Uh, mental health is your problem here. This was a, a very, based on preliminary reports, very deranged individual. But this isn't a guns situation. So according to the president, not a gun situation, let's bring in Keith Bogue, who's in our Washington bureau. And, and Keith, let's talk about the reaction in the United States to, to mass killings like, like the one we just saw. Well, you know, you get a lot of attention to things like gun control when these things happen, as they so often do happen in this country. But what gets less attention is the way in which the culture appears to have been changing over the last, say, couple of decades. There's a new kind of culture of a citizen protector identity uh, growing up among people here, where you see not just an increase uh, in the sense of defensiveness and buying handguns and so on, although all of that is true, but you also have this incredible increase in the number of people who have concealed carry permits. That includes the President of the United States, by the way. Fourteen and a half million Americans now have uh, concealed carry permits that allow them to carry their own handguns. And it's all growing out of the sense of defensiveness, but also the sense that being able to protect yourself and your family and your community is a sign of status in the community. And so it turns out in Texas, we saw that neighbor and the guy who drove him, they did exactly that. Uh, the neighbor was armed and he intervened. Yeah, and that's going to get, a, a, you know, the attention of a lot of people who already have those sympathies, whether they uh, get the same media attention or not. And the other thing, of course, 
Ian, is that for the gun manufacturers and for the NRA, they know what this event means. They know that nothing boosts gun sales like three different things. One, the threat that politicians will take away people's guns or at least make it harder for them to get. Two, terrorist attacks. And three, exactly the kind of thing that we saw in Texas yesterday. So while there will be some kind of uh, debate in the media and so on about gun control, in fact, for all intents and purposes, all practical purposes, that is, the debate over gun control here is essentially over, and the NRA won. All right, Keith, thank you. Thanks, Ian. And now, Adrian, let's pick up on, on one of the points Keith made, and that is the, the somewhat counterintuitive connection sometimes between presidents and gun sales. Right. So let's look at this president, a gun-friendly Donald Trump, the first president since Ronald Reagan to address the NRA. Oddly enough, he's actually been very bad for the gun business. So if, if we break it down a bit, let's have a look at a company called Sturm Ruger. That is the company that manufactured the assault rifle used in the Texas church shooting. Its profits last quarter were cut in half. Gun sales were down more than 35% year over year. And yet, when Barack Obama was president, and it looked like Hillary Clinton might become the next president, gun sales soared. So... When people thought they were going to lose their weapons, they started buying up. Now that Donald Trump seems set to protect gun ownership, buying eases off a bit. And, and this is a bit interesting. Shares in Sturm Ruger rose a bit in the days after two of the biggest mass shootings recently, Las Vegas and Orlando. Why? Maybe this is just more confirmation that Americans seem to believe the only way to protect themselves from guns is with guns. And one more note on this story. Uh, we do expect to hear the identities of more of the victims soon. And of course, with each of those names will come a story. So there are four of us here on night one, which is awesome. But of course, that's not going to happen too often. Yes, we are going to be handing out an assignment. It'll be nice to get some fresh air every once in a while. So most nights, only a few of us will be here. But tonight, here we are. So let's keep things moving, shall we? From Feist to Sting, stars from around the world are in Montreal celebrating a Canadian legend. We're going to take you inside the tribute concert for Leonard Cohen. And fallout from a CBC News international investigation into offshore accounts and why it's generating so much criticism for the Trudeau government. And a Canadian exclusive inside the ruins of Rakasiria. Obviously, nothing makes sense in Raqqa now, but some things are particularly strange. It's the baby strollers. Have a look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight of them in this one intersection, all in relatively good condition. Why? The remnants of ISIS from abandoned strollers to powerful narcotics to live explosives. They are all clues to the monstrous evil inflicted on the Syrian city. My story about 12 minutes from now. I think everything, everything. There's three different locations. There's four different voices. It'll be live all the time, which I know lots of people think that was the case, but it will be live all the time. So we'll be able to blow things up and just go live if something is, is happening in the world. You're likely not going to see four people in a studio every single night because that's not what this is about. This is a chance for us to let stories be uh, win the day. Mm -hmm. And so that means a lot of us are spending t a lot of time in the field and not just for breaking news or, or big events, but for stories, the way we've always done them. That's not going to change. I think that it's going to be a national for the times we live in. And, and I mean, in part, the technology, the fact that we Look, I'm old enough that I remember a morning and afternoon edition of the newspaper, right? Those days are long gone. So we have a newscast that's designed for how technology allows us to see so much during the day. We have a newscast that allows us to respond to this, I mean, can I call it a hunger for, for real information? As far as what I bring to the table, I, what I think is the beauty of this team 
is that we all bring a whole different range of experiences to the table, right? And, and different skill sets and different approaches to journalism. And so I'm one piece of that puzzle, right? One small piece. chief fundraiser, Stephen Bronfman, moved millions of dollars to offshore tax havens through a complex web of entities in the U.S., Israel, and the Cayman Islands. We are fully committed to fighting tax avoidance and tax evasion, uh, and will continue uh, to ensure that the CRA pursues uh, all uh, infringers upon that uh, for the many years to come. Opposition MPs were quick to take aim at one of the most powerful players in the Liberal Party after a major document leak exposing the world of offshore tax havens. Stephen, Bro Stephen Bronfman is one of the thousands named in the Paradise Papers. He's the chief fundraiser, a friend of the Prime Minister. The data was shared with CBC, Radio-Canada and the Toronto Star after it was leaked to the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. The details are complex, but here's what you need to know. 13 million documents make up the Paradise Papers, revealing who has been keeping their money in offshore tax havens. Trillions of dollars worldwide are being sheltered from taxation. 3,300 Canadian companies or individuals are named. Among them, three former Prime Ministers and Montreal businessman and Liberal power player Stephen Bronfman. Yeah, I'm the finance guy. Paradise Papers reveal Bronfman was involved in shifting millions of dollars to an offshore trust that may have cost the Canadian government millions in unpaid tax. Now, to be clear, tax havens are legal as long as rules are followed, but governments around the world are potentially losing out. In Canada, for instance, it's estimated, and this is just a guess, at six to eight billion dollars a year in lost tax revenue. And these new revelations are, of course, generating particular political heat for this Prime Minister. Mr. Prime Minister, how do offshore tax accounts mean there's tax fairness for all Canadians? The Prime Minister avoided that question entirely, but the tax fairness line is one his own government has been touting. Here's an answer he did give just two months ago when trying to defend a broad tax reform for small business owners that later was watered down. Wealthy Canadians are encouraged to uh, use private corporations to pay lower tax rates than the middle class. That's not fair, and we're going to end it. No government has worked particularly hard to shut down offshore tax havens, but this one has also said it will protect middle class Canadians. A clear case of hypocrisy for the opposition. This Prime Minister was elected on the promise to work hard for the middle class and those who work hard to join it. The Prime Minister said shortly after his election that tax avoidance Tax evasion is something we take very seriously and promised swift action. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are still waiting. What is the Prime Minister waiting for? We are fully committed to fighting tax, evadance, uh, tax evasion and tax avoidance. That's why we put close to a billion dollars in the last two budgets to do just that. And in investing historic sums to make sure we have the right tools to crack down on tax evaders. Today, Stephen Bronfman issued a statement in which he said he has never funded nor used offshore trusts. Bronfman did acknowledge what CBC reported last night, that he made a single loan to the trust, which was then repaid, but also said he had no other direct or indirect involvement whatsoever in the Colbert Trust. CBC News will have lots more stories about the Paradise Papers investigations all throughout the week. The Fifth Estate's Gillian Finley has spent months looking into Bronfman's offshore trust. Gillian, what, what do you make of his response today? It's an interesting statement, Rosie, because the one thing he doesn't mention is his company, Claridge Investments. He claims no involvement, but the company he's been executive chairman of for two decades is all over the Paradise Papers. Dozens of mentions related to the Colbert Trust. Correspondence about the trust, Claridge people advising on tax matters, there are specific employees quoted who work for Stephen Bronfman. Okay, so what else do the documents tell us about all these different kinds of connections? Here? Well, importantly, the documents make clear the whole purpose of the trust, and that was to facilitate the Bronfman family business as it was expanding into Israel, mm -hmm. to reward Jonathan Kolber, the Claridge executive who was going to head up their efforts there, to allow him to share in the investments and presumably the profits. 
In fact, in correspondence with us, Bronfman's own lawyers acknowledged that. The economic interest of Jonathan Colbert and the Bronfman family were aligned, is the word they say, that they, that they use. So Stephen Bronfman may say he wasn't involved in the trust directly or indirectly, but he sure stood to benefit from it. Okay. Jillian, thanks for this. We don't know what change, if any, will result uh, from the Paradise Papers leak. The Canadian Revenue Agency says that in the wake of the previous leak of the Panama Papers, there are now about 123 audits underway and several criminal investigations. But it refuses to say how many or whether any charges are forthcoming. Montreal made history last night. Valérie Plante defeated incumbent Mayor Denis Coderre in what some are calling the greatest political upset in 50 years. Not only, not only rather, was the 43-year-old city councillor relatively unknown up until a few months ago, but if she can deliver on promises of affordable housing and better transit, she stands to reshape that city for years to come. She's also, sort of importantly, the first woman elected mayor. My 14-year-old boy, son, yesterday said, Mom, do you realize that you will be in history book, in an history book? And then I, I was, I, I, yes, I was like, that's, that's impressive. And it will set uh, the example. And we've seen in the past that when uh, people that are, comes from a different background, and also I'm not a formatted politician because that's also part of the equation, but also being the first female mayor will support other women to just jump in and say, yeah, I can, I can identify, so I will, I will do it. And I hope it will support other people from diverse background, uh, from diverse minorities as well, to feel like, yes, I have, there's a room for me at the municipal level. Andrew, you and I both lived in Quebec. You spent like 10 years reporting uh, in yeah. Montreal. What, what do you make of this? Well, as you say, pretty extraordinary, right? I mean, she was a virtual unknown, as you said, not exactly a household name. Uh, she managed to win despite a pretty low voter turnout, which is a hard thing to do when you're trying to upset the status quo. And she did it against a guy in Denny Coderre, who's heavily favored to win, a guy with a lot of federal political experience, as you know. Yeah, and a lot of, a lot of uh, name recognition. I think it was yeah. just a matter of people were just a little bit fed up of Denny Coderre and, and the way he was attacking politics, and they thought they'd try something new. There was a lot happening there. Uh, still ahead. I loved you in the morning. I kisses deep and warm. Feist is one of the stars who gathered in Montreal tonight to honor Leonard Cohen. We're going to show you how it all came together. Plus, get the real story from CBC News journalists all day long. Find powerful images on Instagram, exclusive video on Facebook, and hey, Tweet us at CBC The National. For every performer you see on the screen, there are literally hundreds of people just outside the range of the cameras, each with a vital role to play. From the master craftsmen in negative film cutting to the technicians who duplicate our scripts, from the artists who design our sets to the delightfully eccentric genius who must edit this film you're watching. I don't think this will cut. Because CBC Toronto's job is serving the public, it must keep pace with community development to go where the action is, to cover and report on a wide range of outside events, whether it be a royal visit, a football game, or a civic election. The Toronto operation has a wide scope. It allows the imagination to stretch farther than a camera cable. Over the years, the gleaming double blue of the huge three camera color mobile units have become as much a part of the fabric of this growing city as her dazzling city hall complex. Now it's okay. Look, you stay. I'm all wound up. I gotta get away. No, this place is beginning to bug me. I'll go. No, no, if you stay, I'll go. I'll go. I insist. I got a better idea. Why don't both of us go? The great bulk of present day programming is packaged and edited electronically and under the nimble fingers of the videotape editor and under the eye of the program producer and script assistant. So that's the one that's about the third number on after the last one we saw. And we'll leave your levels up for a moment. Master Control. And as the name implies, these men and machines are the masters of CBC Toronto. 
the flagship station of the English network. And it is through this sophisticated gear that every film, tape, or live program is funneled. The nerve center of CBC Broadcasting in Toronto isn't hard to find. Just peek under the tower. There you'll see the Jarvis Street Complex, the TV building, flanked by the huge Studio 7 on Mutual Street, and the annex on the right housing the CBC executive offices. And over on the left, the one-time girls' school turned radio building. You won't hear much in the way of school cheers coming from the radio building these days, but you hear just about everything else. sound effects department, kicking up a storm. We hope to get this from Washington, a three billion dollar... Uh... CBC Radio News, one of the most versatile and far-flung news agencies in the world, with tape news reports and live feeds from the four corners of the globe. CBC News, Fine, thank you, Norm. Levels, please, uh, Jim first. British MP Bernadette Devlin flew from Shannon to New York today on a fundraising visit. The world at eight. Good morning from CBC News, etc. That's fine. Thanks very much. Hi, everything okay? Yeah. See you made it on time for once. Oh, please. The world at eight. Good morning from CBC News. This is Jim Chorley with Rex Loring. Here are the headlines. Until just weeks ago, ISIS called Raqqa its capital. Now all you can see from above is the story of a city's blunt destruction. Really, it's just a carcass now. But to see what actually happened during the ISIS occupation, well, you need to get to the streets below. So we did, and we're just back. We saw some gruesome things, and we need to alert you that you're about to see them too. Because in the ruins of Raqqa, the evil is in the details. It almost doesn't matter how many warnings you get about how bad it is. Raqqa still looks even worse on the ground. The wind still carries the stench of the dead. The first roads cleared of mines when ISIS was driven out head right to Naim Square. Do you remember the stories about this place? ISIS's brutal playground, executions, heads on stakes. <laughs> Now, the victors dance. The men and women of the Syrian Democratic Forces, mostly Kurds, some Arabs, backed up by heavy American and British air power, ended ISIS's hold here. So there is something to celebrate, but the city is hardly free. That soldier charging ahead is Ismail Khalil. He used to be a pharmacist here in Raqqa. Wants to show us how diabolical ISIS's rule really was. This is not... The stadium was one of the last structures ISIS held, used as a jail. See those outlines of people in the stands? That's how ISIS snipers trained. Less easy to spot, what cruelties they inflicted down below. Wow, it's dark. Ishmael, من فضلك. شو شو هذا؟ What what is this? الغرفة هاي غرفة للتعذيب. هاي يحطوا فيها الشبح. يشبح الواحد شبح. يعني بعلقوه بالبلينجو. Did you find people hidden here? Alive or were yeah. mostly bodies? I want to show you this. Okay. 
Make no mistake, death still threatens. This, this room is fully mined. And you, you haven't cleared the mines out of here yet? Okay. Below the stadium are kilometers of tunnels linking to other buildings in the city. Some of those are still filled with mines too. Last minute traps laid there by ISIS and ISIS prisoners tortured here until the very end. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Okay. If you, I mean, look at the way the, the concrete is sort of eaten away. So there must have been a lot of weight on that chain. Horrors when you look up, real oddities when you look down. Drugs everywhere. Okay, so Ismail, I know you're a pharmacist. Can you help me with something? No. Uh, there's drugs all over the place here. What, uh, what are they? Massive shipments of this synthetic opioid bound for ISIS have been interrupted all over the world. Okay. A so you're saying it's not actually for the people they're torturing, it's, it's for themselves, it's for the ISIS fighters. Ismail is off again, a man on the hunt, powering right past a leftover Molotov cocktail, emerging from a room ISIS had used as a court. Wow, okay. Akbarat hukum. These are all sentencing documents? ISIS is notoriously obsessed with paperwork like this. This is evidence of something. So what's going to happen to it? We want to burn it. No, Lesh, why, why, why burn it? This is evidence of, of crimes. Hmm. International Criminal Court investigators are trying to build cases, but evidence and witnesses from Syria are proving hard to get. For Ismail, who says he was lashed by ISIS some 400 times, tied to a car and dragged through the streets, justice isn't a court case, it's just revenge. <laughs> He has a list of people he's still hunting. For now, we leave him to his paper and his bloodlust. Raqqa's ruins say a lot. The swarm of fat flies let you know the dead are here. The massive unexploded bombs, mortar shells poised to blow, tell you just how violent the final assault was. Grotesquely, some of those bombs are attached to bodies. That's what that silver cylinder is next to the corpse of this ISIS fighter, a booby trap designed to kill anyone who dares move it. The evil is in the details. Obviously nothing makes sense in Raqqa now, but some things are particularly strange. It's the baby strollers. Have a look at this, one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight of them in this one intersection, all in relatively good condition. Why? It seems that in the last days when a deal was made to let the ISIS families leave, they gathered in several spots around the city to be taken away in buses. The women and the children were allowed to go. All the strollers had to stay. ISIS families were spared. Not so the hundreds of thousands of residents of Raqqa who are dead or displaced. It's a deathly quiet city now, sometimes punctuated brutally. That explosion, we learned, was an accident. Several soldiers were killed tripping mines here in just a few days. The demining teams trying to make the city safe say they see signs ISIS fighters are still hiding here. <laughs> And these teams have cleared streets of mines only to find new ones show up. 
newly planted as in when? Maybe it is the last night and the early morning. Because the, the, the plast on it, it was a new one. So imagine how long it will be before it's safe enough to actually live here. Never mind trying to rebuild any sort of functioning society here. Never mind figuring out who will lead this place. As we moved on to look at the shops ISIS had seized from the people of Raqqa, something moved in the buildings behind us. Did you hear all that? Something, I just put the head out there. Get in the car. There's something in there. Maybe it was nothing. Maybe it was something. But we have to go. The largely Kurdish forces who now hold Raqqa forbid anyone from being here after sunset. And you're only allowed to travel with an armed escort. So the next day, we asked for Ismail. The song is wonderful. Alone in my life. You're not lonely. Are you lonely? Ismail, are you married? No. No. There's a story about a love, a woman he's been trying to find again for years. Sorry, Thank you. Then all his tenderness disappears when looking for his pharmacy in roads ruined almost beyond recognition. It's 40 minutes of angry walking with him, Ismail distracted by every memory sparked by what he sees. Stories of dead kids, frightened survivors. He wears that rage, looks like he still wants to kill. It seems to me that you still want to kill more people. Eh, wallah. Wallah, yes. Yes, yes. But back to the pharmacy. Show me, wh where was your pharmacy, Ismail? Wayne, Wayne's pharmacy. Ah, yeah. That one right It's here. None of that debris has been cleared of explosives. Clean. No, 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 don't, don't, don't. He wants to look, but there's nothing to see and not much to save. He's ready to fight, but no one knows where the next front will be or whether he can ever come home. It's okay, Taib, Ismail, Khalas, it's okay. He is as spent and broken as his Raqqa. There's so much in that story, Adrian, we could talk about, but, but tell me a couple of things that, that strike you. You've been back now for a couple of weeks. Sure, uh, the flies, for sure, the flies, because they every time they're in your face and you can hear them, it reminds you that they're there because of the dead, and it, it makes you angry, you know. Uh, also, it's very confusing for your eyes. You can look at all the gray debris and, and think you're just seeing concrete, and then you realize, no, actually, that's, that's a person, and that's a girl, and, and there's a woman beside her, and there's a wheelchair, and there's a little bag of their possessions, and it just dawns on you, okay, these are the people who are trying to flee when ISIS executes them, and it makes you, it, it makes you so angry, but it's also a good reminder that if we hear death tolls in the next few weeks mm -hmm. from Raqqa, don't believe them. I, I'm afraid you can't believe them because it's going to be a long time before they get those bodies out. You talked briefly about the uncertainty over who controls Raqqa, which now is a, a very important question. Well, you know, we asked some of the Syrian Kurdish forces who were there who's going to be in charge, and they say, we bled to liberate this place. It will be us. But they might be speaking too soon because Bashar al-Assad has said he considers Raqqa to be occupied. And until his forces are in there, it won't actually be liberated. So there's probably more violence ahead for that city. This is a story about ISIS losing territory, but as, as we saw in New York City just a, a few days ago, it is certainly still an organization with influence. It is. Uh, that, that attack on the bike path tells us that the power persuasion 
continues to exist for ISIS, but you know the group is still hunting for new territory, and it's important to have a look that they're actually managing to find some of that territory. ISIS survives now in Yemen, in the desert of the Sinai, and in southern Libya. And it was ISIS that killed four U.S. servicemen in Niger just weeks ago. Go further to Asia, you'll find ISIS-aligned fighters in Afghanistan and the Philippines. So one thing seems pretty clear. As the ISIS empire in Syria fades, the next extremist empire, if it happens, has options. Now, you can take a virtual tour of the ruins of Raqqa with images we captured when we were in the city. Visit our interactive online right now at cbcnews.ca slash the national. Here are some film projectors, the movies. I wonder what it really means, though, to be able to flick a switch and to bring in any part of the world to see the most personal relationships of mankind acted out before us. It's so easy, isn't it? A handy, instantaneous gadget. The tape recorder. Small, portable, can go and the has gone everywhere. India, just a button's push away. Space means nothing. Uh, with a record collection, neither space nor time matter. We can, all of us, share in everything from anywhere and any time. Well, back to box day with the uh, flick of a wrist. Fabian, Frankie Avalon, uh, the voice of FDR, Petrushka, the music of Arabia, the sound of a sports car race in Florida. Even the most Puritan among us engages now each and every day in an absolute Roman carnival of the senses. There are new sights, new sounds, new fabrics, new textures. Well, we're all dedicated libertines. And radio. Well, we've heard the sound of symphonies, of riots, and of battles, and all without leaving the living room. And now, radio goes with us to beach parties. Stick. Or to the baseball game. And each of us with our own private slice of the modern age. We're never out of touch. And television? Well, I wonder who really knows what it means to have pouring into our homes day after day the cowboys, the rock and roll singers, the statesmen, the philosophers, the whole debate of our modern world. Well, surely, our sense of space, of time, cause and effect must be changing. And our attitudes to life and love, to religion, politics and leisure, what of them? Oh, I, I almost forgot the telephone. Uh, we can afford to take it for granted because it's been around so long. Surely, though, our, our sense of space, of distance, the uh, relationship of person from person no longer means what it did. And you'll notice that the image of the telephone goes with the teenager, because he's the only one completely at home using it. And he uses it all the time. That's annoying, isn't it, to be held up even five minutes? Must be a teenager on the other end. Well, there they are. Our new electronic media, or our new gadgets. You push a button, and the world's yours. You know how they talk about the world getting smaller? Well, it's thanks to these that it is. Everywhere is now our own neighborhood. We know what it's like to go on safari in Kenya or to have an audience with the Pope, to order a cognac in a Paris cafe. But not only is the world getting smaller, it's becoming more available and more familiar to our minds and to our emotions. The world is now a global village. A global village. was Patrick Watson earlier tonight. He's just one of the artists taking part in a soaring memorial to Leonard Cohen. It was held in Montreal where Cohen was laid to rest one year ago this week. 
Leonard Cohen died in Los Angeles at age 82, but his family kept it very quiet ahead of his private funeral service that was he uh, held on Mont Royal. Tonight, the official and public goodbye and a mu musical tribute to Cohen's undying legacy. Here's Susan Ormiston at the Bell Center. You can hear Leonard Cohen's incredible talents in every one of the performances here tonight. This tribute is all Cohen, but sung through the voices of others. The unmistakable brooding bard may be absent, but his charisma and his poetry is very much alive tonight. It's a living tribute to Leonard Cohen that so many top artists wanted to sing for him, covering Cohen's most memorable ballads. Kisses deep and warm. Leonard Cohen grew up and forged his musical talent here in Montreal. He died a year ago this week in Los Angeles. I remember you well in the Chelsea Hotel. His family buried him simply and quietly and then set about organizing this farewell. I remember you well in the Chelsea Hotel. Adam Cohen, his son, threw his heart into it, performing the songs he grew up with. This has been part of his grieving. The father and son were deeply close. Cohen told us at rehearsal it was time for him to stay focused and quiet and let the others revive the story of the humble yet soaring balladeer whose soulful music entranced fans for five decades. And Who can forget Suzanne and Cohen's longing for her, rehearsed here by Ron Sexsmith. For you've touched her perfect body with your I think it's a song that's really important to a lot of people. So I just want to do a straight and hopefully do him proud if he's uh, watching somewhere, you know. Montreal is also launching a new signature exhibit, commissioning dozens of artists to create new works out of a storehouse of video and sound, including Cohen's poems, with museum curator John Zepitelli. Page one. The Book of Longing. That voice, unmistakable. Everybody knows that voice. Somebody, you... somebody described it as a velour foghorn. What do you think he left Canadians? There's nobody like Leonard. Um, I mean, he's just an inimitable singular figure who is able to, you know, talk about the Holocaust and making love in the same paragraph. Um, I can't think of any other figure like him, not just in Canada, but in the world. He's still working. Leonard Cohen toured until he was in his 70s. A standout success. He is still packing them in, including the Prime Minister, a Montrealer and a fan. He reminds us to gather up our hearts and go a, a thousand, thousand kisses, kisses deep. deep. In one of his last songs released last year, Cohen wrote, I'm ready, my lord, but Canada and the world was not ready to let him go, and still isn't. Tonight's tribute concert will be broadcast tomorrow on CBC Radio 2 and cbcmusic.ca starting at 8 p.m. local time, 8.30 in Newfoundland, if you want to sit around and have a good cry. <laughs> You'll be able to watch it, though, in January on the 3rd on uh, CBC Television. <laughs> And remember, go deeper on the stories of the day. Earlier in the day, subscribe to our newsletter, cbcnews.ca slash The National. The National Today will take you inside our journalism every afternoon. And this is something else that's in use now and will one day be a part of every home. It's called the video phone. It's very simple to use. Pick up the dial, punch the buttons, and I just press a button, and here I see Lloyd. Hi. Hi, Sandy. And how are you? I'm fine, thank you. I can't see you yet. You can't see me? You no. can just punch up a button. There. Oh, there you are. See, there I'm right are. in front of the lens. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Very good. But I can control this. If I'm off-center, you can't see me anymore. 
So, uh... You'd only want to do that if uh, you weren't properly dressed, though, wouldn't you? Right, so there'll be uh, no peeking at ladies when they're dripping wet and fresh from the tub. Say, what's going on here? Hey, oh, what's your name? What are you doing? Je m'appelle Guillaume Lieberman, et je crois le français. Oh, he says he's Willie Lieberman, and he's uh, learning how to speak French. Well, tell me how this little machine works, Willie. Well, this is a teaching machine, and it's very simple. Even an adult could use it. <laughs> you see, in this box on magnetic tapes are 22 15-minute French lessons. Mm -hmm. So say I want lesson number five. I turn the dial and pull the switch. Yes. Now, after each phrase in French, there's a pause. So if I want, I can repeat the phrase into this microphone right here. Mm -hmm and it will be recorded on another channel. Mm -hmm. Later, I can turn back and hear both myself and the teacher, and I can check my pronunciation. That's great. I say, uh, Willie, how would you like to have a nice, juicy hot dog? Oh, oui, monsieur. Oui, bon, très bien. Uh, Sandy, can we use your oven? By all means, we Oh, right viens, mon vieux, on va manger quelque yeah, chose de bon, viens. Oui. Lloyd, Willie's machine is not experimental. It's actually being used in schools today. Well, now, here, Sandy, I see a very old and a very beautiful painting. It looks great, but I don't quite to see the point. What's this got to do with the future? Well, it is very beautiful, I agree, and, it, and it's real. It was painted by Albert Kuyp, and it was painted in the 17th century and now hangs in the art gallery in Toronto. It's worth about $20,000. You see, some things won't change. Ovens and telephones and teaching aids make it newer and more progressive. But this painting represents something which is very dear to us. And that something, in a word, is art. I ran to the door and looked outside and the officer was down and bleeding. And so I just closed the door and locked it and said, call 911. Piecing together the moments before an officer was shot dead in Abbotsford, B.C. On The National Tonight, we are working to learn more about the alleged shooter. Right now, we know he's a man in his 60s from Alberta, and we know he's in hospital in custody. We'll keep you posted on any new details as we learn them. Another story we're keeping tabs on, U.S. President Donald Trump on the move. He left Japan for South Korea about two hours ago. The big topic when he gets to Seoul, the threat that is North Korea. The era of strategic patience is over. Some people said that my rhetoric is very strong, but look what's happened with very weak rhetoric over the last 25 years. Look where we are right now. Trump's trip to South Korea is short, only about 24 hours. He'll spend some of that time touring a U.S. military base, which is only about 100 kilometers from the North Korean border. Well, that is it, gang. We're here at the end of the first hour of the first edition. Before we go, quick look around our brand new set in Toronto, the old national room, but a brand new look. Nice and big, too, eh, Rosie? <laughs> Yes, mine fits inside my pocket, but that's okay. You know, the other thing that's great is we can live update uh, for the rest of the country through the evening. Andrew, that's your job there in Vancouver, and that's wonderful to see. Yeah, uh, every night's going to be a long night for me. That's uh, kind of the way it works. But, I mean, also, you, you know, I think Canadians are used to seeing you with your, your thumb on the political heartbeat of the country. And, of course, that's going to be a, a big pillar of this program moving forward. You broadcasting from Ottawa. So we've got Ottawa, we've got Vancouver, we've got Toronto. Over there, Adrian. As speaking of Toronto, if we could take a swing and have a look at the corner of the studio, this is sort of our, our museum. Uh, this is a, this is a nod to the great uh, legacy and history of this place. There's some interesting things that are in there. Knowlton Nash's glasses are there. Uh, Peter Mansbridge's television from 1970s, and that right there, that is a note that Knowlton Nash left to Peter in 1988 when he took over the National. Peter made copies of it for us uh, when it was our turn. In this gang of four, I'm the old guy, I guess, and I was actually a reporter for The National when Knowlton was still the anchor. And so uh, we have all the new technology. We have the kid there in Vancouver, and uh, I guess I'm a connection <laughs> to a little bit of the legacy of the show. That is The National for Monday, November 6th. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.